The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hi, I'm David. Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down toys, tools and appliances just to find out what's inside. Today we're going with something most people probably won't recognize. This is the Sinclair TV80. Now the TV80 is a product which I'm guessing most people probably won't know or recognize. Uh, it was released in 1983 by Clive Sinclair, same guy responsible for the Sinclair C5 or the Sinclair ZX Spectrum which most people probably will be familiar with. Uh, however, this is a portable TV. Now this was Clive's second sh shot at going for a TV. Uh, the previous version was terrible. <laughs> uh, but this one wasn't exactly a commercial success. It only sold 15,000 units uh, in the UK and was deemed uh, a failure. So let's have a look, find out a bit more about it and find out why it may have failed. For something that had such a limited production run, you would expect it to be much more expensive now. But um, of course, this was built in the 80s when analog television transmission was the only thing available. Now, analog TV transmission was completely switched off in the UK. I think the last region to get turned off was 2011, which means there is absolutely no use for this at all anymore. So even of those 15,000, however many of them survived, they are nothing more than collector's items right now. Now, I have to be honest, I was really keen to try this. Uh, and I was racking my brains to think of anything analog I had that I could try it with. Uh, and the closest thing I could think of was my N64. But as it turns out, I'd actually got rid of the RF uh, encoder for that as well. I only have composite cables left for it. So even I struggled to get a TV signal that I could even try it with. Now, it didn't work. For anybody not familiar, it should have looked like this. And unfortunately, all I got out of it was this. So I'm not sure whether that's incompatibility of something I'm not familiar with, or whether something else is broken. Okay, so th the construction has this weird slot on the back, and I've never actually managed to work out what that slot's for. Hopefully we'll be able to drive it. I wonder if it's some weird custom battery pack. Okay, so this white cable up here is actually connected to the antenna. The customary use of what looks like masking tape inside electronics, only in the 80s. Only low cost TVs in the 80s probably. That's still not really, I'll say. So it had a nice little kickstand, which is this assembly, which is a nice touch that actually, I wish my phone had, I had the, HDC HD7 at one point, which had a lovely little kickstand uh, sort of surrounding the camera. I wish my current phone still had that. Kickstands are nice to have. Oh, of course, the obligatory warranty seal is no longer intact. So at the front, to make the screen larger, this, uh, this is called a Fresnel lens. It's not actually just a plastic cover. Hopefully you can see the distortion on my fingers as I look through it or even... <laughs> Now, Fresnel lenses are the cool things that you've probably seen people make solar cookers out of. They're not a single curve. They're actually uh, little compound bars which make up a single lens. If you want to see a cool application for a Fresnel lens, look at the automatic lighting, uh, landing assist lights on aircraft carriers that use Fresnel lenses. They're cool. So that's sort of well and truly baked into the front here. It's, it's, melted in. They look like they've just run a soldering iron across it, to be honest, which they probably did. But here's the business end. So in a normal CRT, you have the electron gun at the back, the magnets for steering, and they typically hit the back of a phosphor coated screen. And that, when hit with the electrons, actually glows to produce the light. Now we saw examples of that in the camera and in the iMac G3. This TV, this system, as far as I'm aware, is one of the only examples of a sideways CRT. So your electron source is over here. You can actually see inside here, you've got the, uh, the, the heating plates, which it's described as heating and boiling off the electrons. So that's your cathode and the electrons are fired downrange this way. 
Uh, and along here you have all the steering magnets and steering mechanism. Now you can see on the back, it's quite, quite loose. Um, some of these steering mechanisms. So you've got the horizontal and vertical scanning lines, which then fire across and there's a permanent magnetic field or electromagnetic field going front to back, which then curves those electrons down onto the screen. And that produces that little, um, what looks like a very nice widescreen rectangle now uh, is the screen. So you obviously don't get a nice uniform pixel size, but then it's stretched by the Fresnel lens to appear four by three, the old aspect ratio for TV. Now there's a lot, fortunately, of pots around here for all sorts of um, calibration and configuration. You can see the CRTs actually are sealed. This will be under vacuum. And see at this end where the glass is uh, positioned, it's being vacuumed out of a point and heated and then sealed there. So you can see the connections across here to the CRT. And actually this this front plate is just fixed on. It's not a complete unit. Obviously it's glued and sealed around there to maintain the vacuum. And down here we have a variable, your tuning, nice worm drive. And this would have been used to tune in the channels. Oh, I didn't show this before. That's your antenna size for your nice, tiny, portable TV. I, I wouldn't describe it as discreet. Now, there is a dip-mounted integrated circuit down here, labelled Ferranti ZN401E-28507. Now, as far as I'm aware, there's nothing digital, uh, or there's no digital control on this at all. So that must be probably an op-amp maybe an integrator. I don't believe it's custom for the board, but I might have to search for that on the internet and find out exactly what it is. RV2, this is the on-off switch and the volume. This, is, this isn't you don't see anymore with machines that are going to standby and have digital control. So this is a single rotary wheel that's got a click for on-off. When you turn it on, it stays at low volume and you just keep rolling and it goes, turns the volume up as well. Okay, so I've just looked it up, and this uh, this I see that sits in the dip down here is a custom chip that was produced exclusively for this. So this integrated circuit is actually like a TV on a chip. It handles pretty much everything you need. It does the CRT high frequency control, but then passes it to the high voltage circuitry down here. It does the analog tuning and control. It does the audio amplification. So this, this little chip is a TV on a chip, or an analog TV on a chip. Don't get me wrong, it's not like it's got an EMPEG-2 capable processing on it. But that's actually the, the brains of the entire thing, just there. All the rest, everything else is just completely passive, which is really kind of cool, actually. Um, it looks like it survived incredibly well. I'm not seeing any signs anywhere. I mean, don't get me wrong, the sides on these are getting a bit grubby, and similarly, the contacts on the power. Maybe a bit of contact cleaner, we'll see if we can get it turned on and actually tuned into the N64. I might just cycle some of the, the crystals and the pots just to make sure they haven't seized, but return them to their original location. See if we can actually get the picture fully filling the screen. See if we can get it tuned into something useful, maybe. As with all CRTs and actually all electronics, extreme caution when things are plugged in. You will probably notice I've upgraded my screwdriver. This is now a thousand volt insulated screwdriver rather than my portable set. I will not be touching anything but this and the glass on the front of the CRT. It's now plugged in. I know it's only a nine volt source, but they up this so much. It's still very risky. So, and I would say you've got to be cautious about the type of radiation that's being emitted from this, but actually there's no way of accessing these pots with the cover on. So this must have been done in the factory. Not to say back in the 80s it was a safe process in the factory, but we're going to do it all the same. As you can see, you get a very low brightness actually through the Fresnel lens because all the energy is having to be spread to compensate. Right, with my trusty N64 nearby, if I put the antenna output on there, try again to tune it. That further I got at all earlier on. Hmm. 
no way. All we had to do was reseat the chip and there you go, there's GoldenEye. Let's talk for a minute about the electronics we've got in here. So we found this little integrated circuit, which is apparently essentially TV on a chip. All the rest of the board is just the passives and the interaction. So you've got headphone output here, power input here, volume and power switch, and also your tuning. Now you've got the pots for the calibration and setting up of the CRT, and I thought this was essentially broken, but clearly it wasn't. All it needed was that chip reseating in its dip socket, and with the right inputs, it now works, which is awesome. I'm clearly gonna waste too much of the rest of my evening trying to get my N64 wired up to this in a sensible way. But actually there goes, it sort of goes some way to sort of say, this is actually a really robust product for something which didn't go through many design iterations, so it was quite immature, only a manufacturing run of 15,000. And what are we, uh, 34, 35 years later, 36 years later, still works as intended. All right, the, the, the low quality monochrome screen, the probably very poor battery life, I never found anything on the battery life, went some way to saying why it was never popularized, but as a technology that was developed for a one-off product, it's glorious. It's really clever, really neat, and seemingly robust. I mean, this, this 80 pounds at the time of release is 250 odd pounds today, which is what, about $300. You know, people blow that on a smartphone easily. Um, but this must have been really nicely and robust made because none of the caps, nothing on this is showing particular signs of age other than the inherent technology. It's, it's amazing, it's a great little bit of kit. It's almost kind of sad that this technology, this technique of side CRTs was developed and, and never really went anywhere. I've certainly never come across any uh, using this technique before. If you can think of some, let me know in the comments below. I'd be fascinated to see what else may have made use of that technology. But for anybody who knows much about Clive Sinclair and the Sinclair company, I think this is where a lot of their inventions went. They were just too far ahead of their time. The C5 would released today would be much bigger success than I think it was when it was originally released. If, if somebody had given me this in 1994, even in black and white, and said, play your N64 on it, I, it would have blown my mind. Something I could put in my pocket and travel around with. And you've got to bear in mind, this would have worked right up until 2010, black and white, but you could have watched telly on the go with it. It's kind of sad that it didn't take off. Like I say, I'm going to go waste the rest of my evening trying to get my N64 permanently wired up to this. I hope you found it as interesting as and exciting as I have. Um, if you've got ideas for a teardown or you'd like to ask some questions, please head over to the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Just while I tidy up and put some bits and pieces away, I just wanted to address a comment from YouTube regarding the fax machine episode. Uh, somebody called Bruce A, who appears to have worked for a fax machine manufacturer, um, actually made a clarification. That dual layer uh, scenario that I saw behind the buttons actually um, was designed for another purpose, although it led to other benefits. Uh, the purpose actually was to make sure that you could use the analog side of the phone even when there was a power cut. So the analog side draws its power from the phone line, meaning you could make emergency calls on it even when your mains power or your circuits were off, meaning the digital side of the fax machine was off. Thank you, Bruce A, for pointing this out. Makes a lot of sense as well. And uh, yeah, please, please keep commenting. Get in touch over at the Element 14 community. I do try and read everything that people post. Uh, for me, it's, it's just continued learning and other people have much more knowledge on a lot of varied subjects than I do. Please keep commenting and uh, I'll do my best to get back to you. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.